<laughs> Thank you. So my name is Marcia Jacket. I am a Google Fellow for Students for Sensible Drug Policy, SSDP for short. It is an international non-for-profit grassroots organization that um, educates and empowers and mobilizes young people to take part in the political process that affects their lives directly and um, work um, to, to reduce the harms of counterproductive drug policies. Um, we are currently comprised of chapters in 50 U.S. states and 32 countries over the world. And um, we organize locally, connect globally, and we have been um, in existence for 20 years. And during these 20 years, some of our um, regional groups have um, gotten their own separate organization as they gained the larger momentum. So it's really a pleasure to be joined here uh, today with, with Michelle from the Canadian uh, Students for Sensible Drug Policy and Jessica from SSDP UK. And uh, so for just a short introduction, I wanted to talk about why we're talking about this very specific aspect of harm reduction and cannabis. And it is, there is like two reasons for it. One is that young people are uh, the main consumers of cannabis that I will show you. And the other one is that the protection of youth has been a, a widely, widely visible and audible excuse for the current policies that we have right now. They're very punitive and preventive. And, um, We've heard that we are a key population in policy making. And on, on the slide you have the, the, the slogan of the United Nations General Assembly Special Session in 2016 that put um, creating a better tomorrow for the world's youth at its heart. Um, but we are very recently at, really asked about how we imagine this, this better tomorrow or there's not really specific references to use in any of the conventions or policy papers that are guiding our policies globally. Um, so, um, when it comes to harm reduction and effectively creating a safe environment for you, there is a lot of slack to be picked up for, by us. And um, we can move on to the next slide, okay. because I just want to really quickly give you an idea about um, the spread of cannabis use or the trend of cannabis use among young people. Um, besides it being the, uh, the, the substance that is uh, seized at the largest quantities in 2016, um, it is um, mostly used by young people. It is, um, yeah, um, we have uh, about 13.8 uh, million young people who are mostly students. And on the side note, most of the data that the United Nations or any uh, policy-making body uses is based on people who are in classical traditional education, which is obviously doesn't cover all the young people who are exposed to cannabis or any kind of other substances. I just wanted to put that point in here. Um, so, um, the annual use of cannabis among 15 and 16 year old people was uh, slightly higher than among the general population and um, you can see that uh, the use of cannabis since uh, 20, you know, 2006 to 2016 have been 16% um, higher. And this is United Nations data, so even by their own standards and suppressing the, the discouragers of these drugs, they have failed. So we are here to really critically think about these policies. But, um, and I have another uh, slide about, I think, uh, the European prevalence. Yes, just to, again, to demonstrate that when you see these age cohorts, uh, it is really um, a prevalent issue among uh, 15 to 24 year olds. And so on my previous note, I just wanted to make, um, to put it on the record that no drug is with the consumption of any drug is not without a risk, be it legal or illegal. <laughs> and so, um, when it comes to um, talking about policy change and reform, and we are having debates uh, with people who are the opposite opinion of us in what would be an ideal scenario, a lot of their worries and, um, um, yeah, really worries and, and, and uh, fears are rooted in legitimate reasons, but we think that there is another way than just suppressing these issues and prohibiting them to address these and effectively create a healthy environment uh, for young people. And so, um, most scientific so, uh, research suggests that um, early adolescence is a critical risk period, and medical research shows that, shows that the use of cannabis between the age of 16 um, can really affect a person's development, mental health, and um, likelihood of, of being vulnerable to further substance use and abuse. So, um, um, I mean, this, this data can be, 
the importance of this data can be debatable, but it is a fact that um, young people are often um, uh, exposed to uh, a dangerous uh, environment. As you guys said, there is a lot of information that suppressors are talking about are the real issues that we are facing, and not just the, the effect, but not just the extent of the use of the substance, but the underlying issues of what are we responding to in reaching out to substances. And um, there have been, the United Nations have recognized that these not just only differ from person to person, but region to region. And they have drawn a paradigm that there are some young people who use it to enhance their life experience, as in recreation, and there are young people who are in extreme conditions and they need it to, to deal with their conditions. And that's why they turn to substances. And there are, again, many other indicators that can affect us that are often out of our control. So I think that, um, yeah, just coming back to something that is really the, the, the bottom line here today, as you guys have already introduced this, is the availability of information and education. So, um, yeah, um, I kind of lost my thought here a bit, but, um, <laughs> But I wanted to um, raise another set of data that I have not put on uh, the slides is from the Global Drug Survey. Because uh, it is a self-disclosure um, data collection tool. Um, a lot of people in policy making question its legitimacy, but we have seen that if over 50% of the people um, below the age of 26 have admitted to using cannabis, but not only this, 31% of these young people have already tried to reduce significantly their use, and 30% of them are planning to, to um, change their behavior in the next year, but only 10% of them are uh, thinking about seeking help. And now this change doesn't have to be radical, but even just talking about your use and um, possibly problematic patterns in your use, um, can be um, difficult when society disposes you to, to not be um, not feel safe about uh, talking to the, talking about this to your peers, family, whoever, because there are all these stigma around it. So this is what we do with SSDP. Mainly, we we create um, spaces where we can truly talk about our experiences, and um, among these conversations, we have um, obviously identified that the current like, illegality of the substance is a huge problem. And so we have created a cannabis reform toolkit um, that has been used in the U.S. in 28 uh, states, in 20, no, sorry, 28 ballots that were successful both for medical and uh, legal reasons. And this has been since 2010. And since 2012, we have operating a cannabis phone bank to actually inform the voters about the ballot initiative and educate them what it means. Um, and in the next slide, I just have a couple of pictures about other actions that we do. Um, we do engage in classical activism on the streets, protests. We organize uh, stakeholder meetings with policymakers. Um, we represent our peers at the United Nations. And um, one of the things that I'm, I think the whole SDP family is really proud of is that with the, the trend or the changing paradigm in Canada, with cannabis legalization, we have contributed or the Canadian this organization has contributed largely uh, to the to also the reform of education when it comes to cannabis and drug consumption. And this is why Michelle is here to talk about how that happened and how it looks like. Oh yeah, well, you have Thank the you. microphone here as well. Okay. Um, so before I get going, just wanted to um, declare any uh, perceived conflicts. I'm a paid, re paid research assistant on a clinical trial um, in Canada that's being sponsored by um, a licensed producer of cannabis. And CSSDP has received some funding from industry um, for our Sensible Cannabis um, Education Toolkit. Um, this was more out of uh, necessity than anything. It's really hard to secure funding for these types of initiatives, especially being a student organization. We're entirely volunteer-led. So we, um, you know, even just applying for grants is really quite um, a big uh, job for us. Um, but this was an unrestricted grant and uh, we got the money and we had a lot of um, great people help us review the, um, the information that we put in there to make sure that the, any sort of like biases uh, didn't exist. 
Um, so as Orshi said, uh, we young people use a lot of cannabis, and Canada is pretty unique in that we use a, a lot more cannabis than most anywhere else in the world. Um, so it's really great that we have legalized it because, of course, this means that meant nearly 50% of young people uh, were being criminals prior to October 17th. So it's a really also ripe environment for us to create this new type of educational document to uh, hopefully change the way that we are talking about cannabis with young people and then also reducing the harms of that use. So a big aim of our toolkit, and I have uh, one here that happy to pass around, and you can flip through it after. It's available for free online. But a big part of it was increasing health literacy among young people. So young people are smart. They're capable of making decisions when provided with the information. So health literacy, uh, this is a good little quote, is the ability to access, comprehend, evaluate, and communicate information as a way to promote, maintain, and improve health in a variety of settings across the life course. So up until really recently, young people weren't seen or they weren't treated like they were able to make these decisions. Instead, they were told that cannabis was going to lead to all of these terrible health consequences, you know, all of the things that I'm sure many of us have heard uh, in our education. And so we wanted to create this. There's a, a large section in the back, a huge literature review on what the research says. So it's a little bit technical. It's a little bit dry. We tried to make it readable, but uh, we wanted to provide that for people so that they could make their own decision based on their own unique risk profile. Rather than just saying cannabis is going to lead to schizophrenia, let's say if you have a first degree relative, you're at an increased risk of developing if you use cannabis. So then someone can actually make a really informed decision. So part of what spurred this on was prior to legalization, we realized that we weren't really being consulted. No one had, it felt like the people that were being included in the legalization process and in the policy drafting weren't necessarily representative of all youth. And it was more of a token involvement rather than a meaningful engagement. So you know, one organization being able to put forward one youth to go and sit on this panel, and then that youth might not even have had lived experience using substances, um, or might not have been, you know, the most informed on that topic, but at least they were in the room was kind of the, the thing. So we, we convened this big group in Toronto, uh, in Canada, and from a whole bunch of diverse backgrounds, people that were unhoused, you know, street involved, all the way up to graduate students and everyone in between. And, and we asked them, uh, what do you want to see? What does, what, how can cannabis legalization protect young people? Because that was a big driving force behind this policy change in Canada. And so uh, it turned out actually that the, I just wanted to throw this in there because we're so proud, the task force recognized uh, CSSDP's contribution from this round table. So it was entirely uh, organized by us and ran by us and we created an outcome document that they ended up um, apparently reading and, and using. So that was really wonderful. But what came from this was this recognition that there are a lot of issues that youth were identifying when it came to how they were being educated about cannabis. So, of course, it was abstinence or stigma-based. So if you used it, you were a bad person or bad things were going to happen to you. It didn't talk specifically about cannabis, but more just drugs in general are bad. And it exaggerated the risk. So if 50% of young people are using the substance and then your teacher, or police officer, who's ever delivering this is, or your parents are saying, you know, if you use that, like all this bad stuff's gonna happen to you, but you've been using it regularly, then you start to question a lot of the things that they say. And then again, this dichotomy of abstinence or problematic, there's no in between. Really lacked a harm reduction lens and more of the delivery, um, so parents often weren't having educated conversations. And so the, one, of the great, um, one of the great aspects of the toolkit is we have guiding principles for how to educate people about cannabis. So we don't think that parents are purposefully misleading young people 
parents want to have meaningful conversations with young people. They just don't know how to do it, especially if they haven't used cannabis or the education they grew up with, the propaganda that they've been fed for decades. Uh, how are they supposed to know? So we created a whole bunch of um, guiding principles from the literature on drug education, what's most effective. And then we also created some pull-away curriculum. So little, nice little boxes that parents could read. Just, you know, when you talk to your young person about cannabis, be open. If, you know, don't, don't judge what they say. Use words like this and that and, and just how to really frame that and, and keep it a soft and open conversation rather than one that's judgmental and maybe going to close the door on any sort of future disclosures. So these are our 10 guiding principles. I won't uh, go through all of them. Maybe I'll just give you a second to just see what we thought. So, of course, a lot of these could kind of fall under the, the umbrella of being open, being non-judgmental, recognizing that a large proportion of youth are using and a large proportion are using without big negative consequences. And then um, the inclusion of harm reduction was really essential for us because we know so many were using. So rather than pretending they're not, let's give people the tools to use it more safely. So harm reduction is... I, it's a touchy thing. I think globally it's uh, it's still on the fringes. In Canada, I think that there's a lot more acceptance for it. And so um, there is always that concern, though, that if you tell someone how to do something safely, they're going to do it a lot more. So, of course, we hear that with sex education. If you give condoms, if you teach people how to reduce um, the harms associated with sex, then they're just going to go out and have sex with everybody. Um, but research shows that didn't happen or doesn't happen. And so the same is, uh, research is showing that the same is true for harm reduction when it comes to substance use. So our harm reduction principles were start low, go slow, consider appropriate time and place, um, you know, maybe don't use before school if you're going to use, unless of course you're using it um, for medical purposes. So that would be an appropriate maybe time and place for you then. Choosing less risky cannabis products. So maybe you're uh, choosing a cannabis product that has a lower THC uh, potency. Choosing safer methods of consumption. Maybe don't smoke out of a pop can if you have a vaporizer available. But then recognizing that young people may not be able to afford vaporizers. So, um, you know, just trying to develop a bit of a conversation around what a safer youth use method looks like. Um, and then avoiding mixing with alcohol and tobacco. Um, there you go. So we have a whole, the whole section on, on harm reduction. So again, I, I keep driving this home, but it's all about having these open conversations and, and that is just such a great way to reduce the harms of this practice. Um, so by listening and, and engaging with young people. And you know, if that's too difficult for a parent to do with their kid, then, then maybe um, you know, there's peer groups out there. So peer-to-peer -peer education, that's a really effective way to deliver this content because it's a lot less scary for a young person to talk to someone maybe just a couple years older than them um, rather than their parents who they may not be able to have that quite an honest, open dialogue with. And then... Um, Kind of just wrapping up here, this meaningful inclusion thing's really big for us. So the the people that made this toolkit, it was all young people. Uh, we were all under 30. I think there's six or seven of us. Um, of course, we had a great team of um, adults. I guess I'm an adult too, but um, <laughs> like we had a, we had a, big, a team of, of you know working professionals and professors and things uh, take a look at it. But it, it was created by youth, and we uh, we workshopped this toolkit. So we set up workshops on campuses around Canada. Um, we toured around um, to different conferences and stuff, and, and engaged with people about it. So we're going to create another iteration of this toolkit. Even some of our harm reduction languaging, um, we thought that it kind of assumed youth were making a wrong choice. So we're going to change that so that it's a little bit more um, respectful, I guess, of them. And then again, coming back to that tokenism versus the meaningful participation. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure who exactly is in this room, but really including youth in your discussions and your policy making um, in the delivery of your programs um, is really important. 
I think I covered that. And then finally, um, just a couple things. This workshop was a case study, so we thought that I thought I'd just show some of the the things that we're up to up in Canada. When cannabis was legalized, uh, university campuses, w at least the one I go to, wasn't consulting with uh, students at all about what that policy should look like. They said that they'd just show us the policy before it was voted on and then we could comment, rather than actually being involved in the creation of it. So we, um, we got together and we drafted up our recommendations with a really diverse set of youth, uh, you know, from people that, that totally think cannabis is absolutely awful and, and has no place on campus, um, to people people that uh, think you should just be able to smoke freely. And they actually used some of those recommendations um, in the policy creation. So we now have some spaces where young people can use cannabis on campus because uh, our university is a little bit more rural. So if you were to exclude the use on campus, it would be really difficult for someone to be able to go and, and legally use this product. Um, and then we uh, have a little street crew. So we went around and handed out a bunch of pamphlets all about, hey, UBC, that's our school. Cannabis is legal. Here's what you need to know. No, this is the school's policies, don't get in trouble, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, our harm reduction principles. And I'll pass it on. Yes. All right, so I'm going to change the focus a bit towards medical cannabis rather than non-medical cannabis. Um, my declaration and just like full disclosure, I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford. I am an anthropologist by training and I'm researching the process of reform through the lens of the cannabis industry. So as I walk you through this, it's, I'm essentially walking you through like an example of a case study that I've used through my research. Um, I'm partially funded by a think tank out in the UK, and then the rest of it is uh, by my college at Oxford. So medical cannabis in children, medical cannabis is obviously a controversial topic. When you bring children into it, it becomes even more controversial. However, a lot of the way that I've seen through my informants and my research, this process changes when we have these faces up here with normally it's children with epilepsy and then it's the mothers of medical cannabis patients um, who are telling the story and it's this empathetic reaction that's happening. Another thing that I've come across, especially in the US, is this new term called a medical cannabis refugee where parents are moving um, to a legal state in order to administer medicine to their children. Um, and so we're now seeing these different flare-ups and things like that. So I'm going to share an interesting story about this 13-year-old girl called Riley. Riley, um, when she was seven years old, she had uh, tumors that were essentially eroding the structure of her face. She went to the doctors, and they said she had a few months to live. Um, obviously, her mother was not very happy with this outcome um, or the doctor's recommendation, and so her mom started illegally giving Riley um, cannabis oil. And this was the CT scan, um, I think a month before her surgery. And then you can see her uh, in the hospital, and then this is Riley when she was 12 years old. Riley is now, as I said, 13 years old. This is her. They gave her a few months, five years later, tumor-free. She continues to take cannabis um, because she'll have seizures that, are, that will flare up every now and again. Um, and so they call it for, her, like, obviously for her, it was quite a miracle in the sense that her parents didn't know what to do. It was this last resort. Her mom did all the types of research, research that she could do. Um, and then it ended up working. And that was the beginning of Riley's journey, really, because she was and still is a medical cannabis patient. But as a, as a young girl, she didn't have access to get her medicine. So she essentially went to her mom and said, Mom, I can't get my medicine in, in legally. What are we going to do? Like, we can't afford it. What are, this medical refugee type of concept. So she ended up going to her senators in her state of Delaware and sharing her story, opening up, having that dialogue, and sharing this information, bringing the research and saying, I was in the hospital. I started treating myself with medical cannabis, and here I am, still alive. You can't deny the fact that I'm alive. Long story short, she... Um, the first quote is from her mom saying, legislators don't know what the truth is. They think about cannabis as something completely negative. And then when they would go in, they explained to them that it's not about religion, but rather it is about the life of a child, your daughter or your son. They would continue to go in and say to the legislators, imagine if this was your daughter or your son. What would you do in that situation in case? Of course you would do anything in order to save the, your child. Uh, so they asked them to consider exactly 
If that's your only option, what do you do? And then Riley, uh, the only way that she began to conceptualize this, she's like, why don't they understand medical cannabis helps? And she said, everyone needs a near-death experience to believe in it. She had her near-death experience. She began to believe in it, and so the legislators did as well. There is now a law in Delaware called Riley's Law, which is medical cannabis um, access for pediatrics. Again, Riley, of course, didn't stop there. She's literally what I call a modern-day superhero. She, because she needs medical cannabis on an ongoing basis, and she's 12, 13 years old, she's at school. What do you do when you're at school and you need your, your medicine? Normally, you go to the nurse. For Riley, medical cannabis wasn't allowed to be given out by a nurse. It had to be administered by a parent or a legal guardian. So she's in Delaware. Delaware sometimes has crazy, crazy blizzards. She then, leaving her class, is not only leaving the education that she's meant to get at school, she's then putting her health and, and her well-being in danger again, because you can see in this picture is raining, but this is like one day of many days. So like I said, Riley didn't stop there. The next thing they did was in order to help medical cannabis uh, patients at school have their medicine administered um, essentially in school and hopefully by, by a nurse. So she was saying, everyone has, this is a quote from Riley as well, she was, everyone has a right to education, even kids who are sick. I should not have to leave the school property to take my medicine, that I need to be healthier, neither should any, of, uh, any other kids. So in order to take their medicine, they have to put their health in danger. And no matter what they do, they're still putting their life in danger, aren't they? So it's, do you take your medicine? Do you continue to be sick? Or do you go outside in a blizzard and, and walk away with a cold and then and your sickness and your illness continues and it perpetuates? And then it, again, doesn't stop there for Riley. She's at school, she's getting her medical cannabis, and in my health class, in her class, health class, we started to get these different videos about drugs are bad, drugs are bad. Like this misinformation that you were talking about that we've like discussed from the beginning. And so the, the videos out there, they were basically, she was like, I don't understand. Why do they call it pot and marijuana? It's cannabis. And they're like, she's gonna take it. And then every, the only thing in the video was that it's really bad for your lungs and you're gonna get cancer and a bunch of really, really negative things. So then she had to explain to her fellow classmates that what she's taking is a medicine. Yes, it's cannabis, but cannabis does not necessarily mean that it's bad. So one thing that Riley really wants to do is, again, this is a, another quote from her. Um, yeah, so she was saying, I'm not sure why they would single out my medicine or some of my friends' loved ones' medicine. These videos are part of our curriculum, so they have to show them. They just need to be updated or just don't show them. So again, when we talk about the education and material that's going around for students, it's not only coming from, um, from a non-medical recreational side of how to safely consume or things like that, but it's also about this perception and the stigma and understanding it as a medicine for the people that need it as their treatment. Um, and again, it really, I, I keep saying this, like it doesn't stop there, but the fight is an ongoing fight. Um, and so when she wants to, she wants to go to Disneyland, for example, and she lives in Delaware, how does she go to Disneyland and bring her medicine in a state that doesn't like accept the fact that she is a me medical patient? So it's, what is this freedom of mobility? And I'm starting to look at this a bit more in terms of uh, my ethnographic research. What does a medical refugee mean? And, and can we call it that? And, and how are we moving across borders in order to literally just treat ourselves, whether that's well-being or, um, or for an illness or a certain condition? And then also access to medicine in general. In the US, very hard to get insurance. And if you don't have the money to get medical cannabis, as many other parts of the world, um, what do you do? So Riley actually started a foundation in order to help other children get um, their access to medical cannabis. And because she understands the process of what it is like to be living in a hospital day in and out, they also gift iPads um, and iPads out to different uh, sick kids. So access to medicine, like I said, like continues on with the, ge the, the geography, the jurisdiction, but then it's also about what we were saying with this parent and the communication and, and how they are sharing it and what kids are doing now, that we need this open dialogue and this normalization. Um, I think it's, it's a spectrum and this ongoing conversation that we can learn a lot from one person, we can learn a lot from a document, but if the dialogue starts here, then it has to continue. And so we use this as, as a way to kind of open the discussion and the dialogue. To turn it back to why we're here in the conference, 
we want to open it up to the floor as well and understand how does it link from non-medical cannabis, medical cannabis, youth, students, pediatric patients to the sustainable development goals? And is that actually a useful framework for us to understand? And can that help us bridge the dialogue? Or is there something that we're missing? What, what else can we do as youth or as people that may have children, may have nieces, nephews, whatever? We all know youth. How, how can we bridge that all together? Um, so I'll open it up to whoever wants to jump in with that. <laughs> yeah. So um, what the research shows is that telling, talking to people about cannabis before they've used it is the best course of action. Um, and we see the average age of initiation in Canada is between 14 and 16 years old. So uh, there, you know, of course, it, age appropriate is, is kind of the key term there. You're not going to be teaching a nine-year-old how to you know, safely consume cannabis um, non-medically. But it is just talking about it, talking about, you know, the people use substances for many different reasons, and there's cultural reasons and, and stuff like that. And so we're starting to see some curriculum development like that in Canada that recognizes that you can talk about certain things um, in certain ways at, at age-appropriate times. So. Yeah, in the back. Before you were federally legal in Canada, did you have any issues? Did the universities or the schools have any issues with accepting these types of programs on the campus using that federal, you know, illegal stance as a reason why not? Yeah, honestly, it's so it's probably it's, it does vary between region and where I'm from. It's pretty liberal. Um, there's you know, a lot of cannabis is, has really been normalized um, in British Columbia for a long time now. But even still, the, the administrators, you know, I, I paint a little bit of a greater picture than perhaps it, it is. Um, but yeah, they, they didn't want to put up our harm reduction principles because they thought that it was endorsing use. So there is some of that still. Um, so I say that it's easier for us to fight that now because we say like it is legal, like you have to provide this information. Whereas before it was, uh, it did feel like we were a bit more at their will. So, but yeah, having a space to consume cannabis on campus, like that just that still blows my mind. Well, that's yeah. a college campus. <laughs> it's a <laughs> university. People are over eighteen. You know, yeah, but it's good to introduce before in the high school program. Mm -hmm. And the problem with Canada still is that we are, our new Cannabis Act, it still criminalizes people for using cannabis underage and especially for sharing cannabis with an underage person. So you can get up to the way the law is written. I haven't seen this in practice yet, but if, if you share cannabis as like a 20 year old with a 17 year old, you could go to prison for 14 years, uh, which is greater than it was when it was illegal. So. I was just, uh, I, I like to mean, I like people, but um, you talked about changing the language you're writing around harm reduction. It's just something to consider. Maybe try and change the language and get rid of this term harm reduction. Mm. I realize it came in, uh, I think it's a guy from Liverpool brings it in in some way of changing the debate, but uh, I can change it again. It's been there for a long time, it's, it's a problematic term. Don't use it in a whole load of other areas. Uh, if you talk to the rock climbers amongst you, they don't talk about harm, harm reduction in rock climbing. Mm. Uh, it's quite a harmful place. Uh, they use other language. And maybe, because the way you're coming from is very fresh, and it's, you know, you're, you're, you're changing documents, you're changing ways things are being done. Uh, maybe something like that can actually, actually do it. Maybe just give yourself the freedom to say, what words do we want? Mm -hmm. You don't have to use the models out there, because you're already not using the models out there. I, I want more little thing before I forget, because I won't forget. Marianne Mackenberg, activist, did, she was an occupied activist doing the anthropological research on uh, Occupy. Oh. So, and she's saying, what the hell does this mean if I'm involved in it and I'm trying to study it? 
how do I do that? So, uh, Dutch, Macro, and Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Did you want to respond to? Yeah, I actually had something to add on. So, um, I was going to make a comment when you specified you were talking about medical cannabis mm -hmm. because I actually dislike the fact that we're distinguishing between medical and sometimes it's referred to as recreational and, and, and though it's preferred to refer to it as adult use, I'm even somehow not okay with this distinction and the reason being is because all use is therapeutic ultimately um, and how I, I like to give the analogy with alcohol, which is that we may have a very stressful long day and crave a glass of alcohol in the evening, uh, but we don't say we're going to go home and take a glass of alcohol, even though it's an excellent anxiolytic. Mm -hmm. We say we're going to go home and drink a glass of alcohol. Same way we say I'm going to go smoke a joint, not I'm going to go take a joint. <laughs> Like, or, you know, take my medicine. It's, it's not necessarily, although it ultimately lead, leads to uh, therapeutic value and um, it is improving your quality of life, which ultimately should be the purpose of any medicine, uh, the intention is irrelevant. And so um, what I'm trying to say is that if we then try to pigeonhole use into the term, uh, well, it's medical cannabis use, then we may be leaving out some conditions, for instance, because then you have to check boxes. Well, what is your pathology? Okay, so the reason why I bring up this example is because uh, when I was at my aunt's wedding when I was four years old, I got tanked on uh, leftover floaters of champagne. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, but you know, I didn't turn into an alcoholic. And my dad always offered me uh, sherry with Christmas dinner, and I turned it down because I wasn't interested. Um, and we, we had the conversations, and it was open and honest. So I agree with this. But cannabis, on the other hand, I suffered from bulimia and anorexia since I was 15 or 16 because I lost my mother when I was 13 to cancer. And they also pre prescribed cannabis to her, by the way, but she grew up Roman Catholic conservative and therefore declined and lost her life because of it. Anyway. Point being is that then I developed uh, these depressive disorders that are connected with depression, and I was so terrified by cannabis. And I had friends who were smoking cannabis at 15 years old, but I screamed when they tried to hotbox me, and I hid under the car. So, like, I think that um, had I had that education, that maybe it could actually help me and be beneficial, that I would have saved myself years of eating disorders. And by the time I finally discovered cannabis, I was 18 years old, that condition still isn't covered under most medical programs, and I managed within a year to recover from bulimia, which usually takes some kind of external um, in inter interference, yeah. So, um, and my cousin, who also lost her mother, my mom's sister, to cancer when she was nine years old, she developed bulimia, and six years after that, they found her dead on her bathroom floor. She had never tried cannabis before. So when we distinguish with like language, it is really important. It is really important, and it's also important that we recognize ways that we can defeat our own purpose. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the language, like for, for us to define from medical to non-medical, is oftentimes just borrowing from legal terminology. Yeah. Yeah. And and whether or not we agree with the way the policymakers write the law, it's how it's being adopted because it is this new emerging industry. It's, it's maybe why it's easier also to guide the ones that never had quite an, uh, were never exposed to drugs or cannabis information. Yeah. It's easier to explain that uh, it has medical properties and you can use it recreatively than Defining all the therapeutic concept and uh, uh, and that actually it may have no there's no difference at all. But for a person that uh, was against it or that is dealing with cannabis for a first or second time, uh, maybe too much information for just one. one
We started late, but now we are over time. So should, I don't know. I think is there another panel after us? Yes, there is. Okay. But if you have like, we'll start. We can start. We we'll catch up with breath a little bit, but yeah, like maybe one last question. Okay, awesome. Next, yeah, yeah. Just if somebody wants to ask anything, or just have some input, you're more than welcome, of course. I can share, share um, some personal experience or what I, I've been thinking about the, is the problem when we can't reach youth anymore. I think um, what you have also talked about that a, a policeman comes into the classroom and teaches you about how bad cannabis is and you late in the evening you know you smoke a joint and oh, it's not happening. And that creates, I think that's the first um, contact from, from, from pupils. Uh, with politics, it's mostly the, the first contact because uh, yeah, the, the teenagers don't really care about politics, and it, the first contact with, 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 with governments is like they are talking bullshit, and then you start to mistrust the government because they are telling you the stuff that you use makes you this and that, and it, it's never happening. It's not ha happening in all my my, my friends, and uh, what I've seen that. All of my friends turned anti-government, they turned to um, conspiracy theories and, and all the bullshit because the official media was lying, because they had the proof that talk bullshit about cannabis and then they conclude everything else that the government was telling me is also mm -hmm. not true because that was the first contact I had with the government and I think the government uh, is doing the absolutely wrongest thing to, to reach the, the people with the prohibition. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm, I'm glad that uh, you are yeah. doing these all things here. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think as youth, and this is all, almost how we started our conversation, like, let's raise the questions. Let, let's challenge the, the facts that are, are, we are told are the facts. And I think as young people, we feel a bit more free <laughs> to do that. Um, so it's just to show that, like, continue to be verbal and, and share that.